Okay. Do you want to pick back up where you were? I think you were. No, you were. Where were you? You were about. I don't know. The bird was black, neither large nor small. <laughs> okay. English, uh, but... Yeah, we were at the uh, Movimientos Exagerados, was I think where we left off. Thank you, Jerry. You're an excellent moderator. Thank you. Thank you. I, I studied very hard at moderator school. <laughs> okay. Should I keep going or what? Yes, yes. Okay, good. Entonces, then, um, es un pájaro negro, ni grande ni chico. Con su afilado pico de goma rosada recoge los pedazos de carne y los engulle haciendo gestos exagerados. Mi mujer y yo esperamos a que el veneno haga efecto, o sea, esperamos a que el pájaro se intoxique y muera. Pero esto no sucede nunca. El veneno no lo mata, lo hace hablar. Y el pájaro habla con una voz que suena como algo grabado en una cinta muy antigua. Hemos discutido durante horas sobre el origen de esas voces. Porque no es una sola voz, son muchas voces. Mi mujer ha oído decir que algunos pájaros son capaces de imitar a otros animales y opina que son voces de mucho antes, de otro tiempo, de cuando todavía existían los seres humanos. El canto de este pájaro sería un vestigio uno de los pocos que aún conservamos, una prueba de que antes de nosotros hubo otra especie parecida, capaz de hablar y de producir pensamientos. Esa especie desapareció misteriosamente del planeta y los científicos no saben cómo interpretar la escasa evidencia disponible. Por eso tampoco sabemos de dónde venimos nosotros, de qué animales descendemos. Los relojes se reiniciaron en algún momento, dice mi mujer, mirando hacia los, mirando hacia los pinos muertos como si supiera algo que los demás no sabemos. Es una supersticiosa. A mí, en cambio, me da miedo que el pájaro no se muera, que el veneno no haga efecto, como si ocurre con los demás animales que vienen a nuestro patio. Los folletos del ente gestor en eso son muy enfáticos. El peligro de contagio es muy alto. Todo animal debe ser exterminado. Cuando el pájaro se cansa de hablar, una vez que se ha comido el último pedazo de carne envenenada, Alza el vuelo y nuestro bebé llora desde el interior de su capullo de seda azul y roja, donde sigue incubándose. El llanto y la partida del pájaro están sincronizados de algún modo, pero no es posible saber si existe una relación causal o si se trata solo de una coincidencia en el tiempo de dos eventos inconexos. Ya nos han prometido que nos evacuarán como hicieron con los primeros. Iremos, si todo sale bien, a un planeta nuevo, entre tanto, esperamos sin hacer mayor cosa y somos razonablemente felices. Algunas noches paseamos por el barrio, por el bosque de pinos muertos. De vez en cuando vamos a bailar. El ente gestor nos dice que nuestra casa será la garantía que nos permitirá tener una vivienda similar en el lugar donde nos realojen. Las leyes de propiedad en eso son estrictas. Thank you, Juan. Day one. I'll start by explaining what's happening with the bird or else I might forget. The bird shows up every night when the sun is going down, a liquid sun like melted cheddar surrounded by moldy fog that sprouts from the blue branches of dead pines. After circling for a while, the bird perches and pecks at the bits of poisoned meat, which following the managing entity's instructions, we've set out on the garden wall to entice him. The bird is black, neither large nor small. With his sharp pink eraser of beak, he collects bits of meat and swallows them in exaggerated movements. My wife and I wait for the poison to take effect, or rather, we wait for the bird to be poisoned and die, but that never happens. The poison doesn't kill him, it makes him talk. And the bird's speaking voice sounds like something recorded on very old tape. We've spent hours debating the source of those voices because it's not just one voice, there are many. My wife has heard talk of birds that can imitate other animals and she believes their voices from much earlier, another era, back when humans still existed. This bird song must be a vestige, one of the few we still have, proof that before us, there was another similar species capable of speech and thought. That species disappeared from the planet mysteriously and the scientists can't decipher what little evidence there is. So we don't know where we came from either, what animals we're descended from. 
At some point, they reset the clocks, my wife says, looking out at the dead pines like she knows something the rest of us don't. As for me, I'm afraid that the bird won't die, that the poison isn't working the way it does on the rest of the animals that show up in our yard. The managing entity's pamphlets were emphatic about that. The risk of infection is very high. All animals must be exterminated. When the bird is tired of talking, when he has eaten the last piece of poisoned meat, he flies off and our baby cries from inside the blue and red silk cocoon where he's still incubating. His cry and the bird's departure are synchronized somehow, but it's impossible to tell if there's a causal relationship or if two disconnected events have simply overlapped in time. They've already promised that we'll be evacuated just like the others before us. We'll be leaving, if all goes well, for a new planet. Until then, we wait and do little else, and we're reasonably happy. Some nights we take a walk through the neighborhood or the dead pine forest. Occasionally, we go dancing. The managing entity says our house will be the collateral for a similar one wherever we are relocated. The property laws are strict about that. Awesome. Do we <clears throat> want to read day two or are we, what do you guys feel? Maybe we should Whatever go on. You guys tell me. <laughs> Since we had a, a bit of a delay, we yeah. go on to the discussion. What do you think? Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, so something that struck me was reading um, both the, hearing the Spanish for the first time and hearing Lizzie read the English, which I'd read before, um, was how closely actually um, your translation, Lizzie, uh, mirrors the source, which I know is not always the case on like a sy syntactic semantic level. Um, and so I was just wondering, is something about the genre, do you think that makes it easier for you to cling more closely to the, to the source? Um, Cause it didn't read as stilted or, or artificial at all. So would you like to talk about that? Sure, I'm happy to try to talk about that, but I, I don't, no, if I think much about trying to mirror syntax um, as translating as I do about just trying to recreate Juan's expertly rendered and very strange atmosphere. So if I adhered closely to the syntax, um, I'm happy to hear that, but it's not really something that I do consciously necessarily. I mm. think Sometimes I worry that I might um, take too many liberties in the other direction. So maybe Juan can talk <laughs> about if, if he agrees. But I, um, I don't know. I didn't think much about genre while translating this either. Although as I was reading it just now, it does strike me as much more closely related to science fiction, which Juan said when he introduced it, um, than some of his other works. So I would be really curious. To hear about that, but I, I didn't. Um, I didn't try to stay closer to the original than usual. Mm -hmm. um, but it was very fun because it's this. this it's this, the second piece that I've translated by Juan. So I like to think that I've learned how to inhabit his mind <laughs> a little bit, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, but but I just have to, I just have to say a very short thing, and it's a. Uh, uh, um, from the beginning, uh, when I first read Lizzie's translation of Ornamental, my, my well, the novel Coffeehouse Press published last year, I was amazed uh, by her accuracy. And, um, but at the same time, there is something very particular about um, my own writing that Lizzie has managed to um, capture in her translation in a very brilliant way, which is, um, which is this tension between something which is a text which is extremely legible, legible, you know, you can read it very easily. But at the same time, there's this background of, um, let's say, non legible material or the language trying to cast a shadow and uh, you know this very legible language is casting a shadow of absolute illegibility. It, it, it's illeg illeg illegibility, sorry. And um, and and Liz is, is really able to to capture that. She's she's amazing. I mean, 
um, because it, it's a very it's a very subtle thing she does, you know. And uh, I also have this feeling that she was really, really, really um, for at, at some point she was mirroring stuff, but at, but at the same time she was betraying it all the time, you know. And there's there's so many betrayal going on there, which I love it because I'm a translator too, and I do that all the time. So, uh, and it was it was really really a very nice thing to see, you know, in your own words being betrayed in that manner. It was so so good. It was like yes, I did it. So, how <laughs> well, does that make you feel, Lizzie? Um, it makes me feel simultaneously very happy and very concerned with the use of the word. <laughs> because I always think about the idea of translating as leaving no trace, you know, leaving no trace of yourself. And Juan seems to have noticed that I did leave a trace of myself. But <laughs> I disagree. I completely disagree. I hate that idea of this translator as a sort of a sports referee you know a guy who's not, who's not there you know when 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 the referee made a good job it's like no one saw it no, no one saw him but, oh, i like that mm. uh i i i don't like that idea really i don't i love i love when you see the work of a translator and um and that's this is the case i mean this this is amazing this is a, one of those cases when you when you realize it's a it's not a, you have to be noticed, you know, you have to be noticed, Maybe translator a, has to be noticed. It's the <laughs> idea that translation is a creative act, which I'm sure we can all it agree is. since we're all translators, <laughs> but I remember that was kind of a revolutionary idea for me when I first started translating. I thought you just have to be very faithful, but now I know I'm, I'm supposed to betray you left and right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's almost it's a, a one of those common misconceptions among like I think like among translators we have this conversation all the time about what does fidelity even mean, um, but among just the general reading population it's like I mean we're so and this is not a bad thing but we're so secondary like we're so in the background we're so in the shadows that I think um, people are just like yeah just say what the author said just say the words just say it again in English. Um, yeah. So I think, yeah, and it's a much more complex and nuanced situation than that. Um, should we, on the topic of illegibility, should we talk about um, you guys, you guys' novel Ornamental? Ornamental? Um, does that work for you guys? Great. Um, so in this, there is, um, this is also Ornamental by Coffee House Press um, by Juan and translated by Lizzie. And it's a finalist for a Penn Translation Prize and has received all of the positive reviews um, in terms of illegibility, the, the book has these two very contrasting um, styles of this very like dry, you know, doctor's um, uh, uh, sections where he talks about this clinical trial he's running. Um, and then you have this almost stream of consciousness. Um, Juan, I know you've translated Faulkner and these sections actually remind me of Faulkner in, in many ways. Um, these sections where one of the trial patients, number four, has these long stream of consciousness, um, you know, sections that are very um, surreal and lucid. Um, and could you talk about what you were going for in terms of legibility and illegibility and what, um, what you were trying to achieve in these sections? That's a tough one. Um, <laughs> to I, ask a really simple sure. question. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah, that's a tricky one. Um, well, I, I'm not sure what I was exactly trying to achieve by using this uh, contrast of, as you just well put it, like, um, um, but I would say I'm interested in contrast itself, you know? I'm interested in, in seeing what happens when you put together contrasting elements and um, and uh, well, Lisa must be really tired to hear me say this because I've said it so many times. But, but sorry, Lisa, I'm just I just have to say it. You uh, um, <laughs> But I, I I consider myself like a very conceptual writer because I'm a critic too, 
But at the same time, I use language as a material. You know, the way a painter would use his, his paintings are, you know, and then colors and, and uh, sometimes I have the, the, the urge of playing with these materials the same way, you know, a sculpture or an architect plays with it, with his own material. So I would say this, 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 this clash of, of um, contrasting uh, elements would eventually create a very different experience for, re for, for readers, you know? Um, I'm always looking for, for political effects. Uh, I'm always looking for political, I mean, I mean like, um, like uh, disruptive uh, um, effects, you know, the perception and the perception of time and the perception of language and the perception of what you expect about uh, uh, a text to make sense, you know? Um, so um, that's my answer. Sorry if I... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's perfect. Um, okay. And when I was reading, um, I was reading a few reviews of the book um, in preparation for this, for this discussion. And I remember I, I found, um, you know, this book we're talking about, lots of people call the book surreal. Um, I also, one reviewer called it uh, an example of post-narco Baroque. Um, and another, another also called it an archetypal and oddly curious slice of magical realism. Um, and yeah, and I, that, one, hmm, that, one, that one was interesting. Uh, so would either of you uh, like to talk about how you, how you feel about these labels, especially for such a weird, and also, sorry, if I haven't like made this clear, this is a messed up weird novel that like screwed with my head and I was feeling very nihilistic for a few days after reading it. Um, so, so would either that's, of you that, like to talk about these labels? That's perhaps that's perhaps the best compliment the, the novel has ever had, you know? <laughs> I, I, was, I was texting Lizzie at the time being like, what the, did you do? Like, this is not cool. Stop it. Oh, Put this back in Spanish. Um, <laughs> so I would love to hear you speak to that one. I know we've talked about it a little. Well, yeah, well, I, I really, I really, first of all, I really hate this, this um, uh, magical realism uh, label. Um, uh, basically, I find magical realism and a, a very colonial label. Like um, this is like when whenever uh, someone from you know Europe or the States or any part of the world doesn't know how to define a Latin American work, it, it just he just oh perfect. Let's just talk about magical realism, you know, um, and I. I would say that's that's a very unfair label for my novel. <laughs> um, a bit but that's too, same, I thought if I can cut you off, it, I just didn't think it, it applied. It is inaccurate. It is inaccurate. Absolutely. Um, well, I, I you know I, I really like I really like the idea of, of of this novel being a very mm, peculiar way of talking about a lot of issues that are really mm, that really concern us as human beings right now in the present you know you know it's just like late capitalism stuff we're all dealing with I mean we don't know what's going on I mean we're we're all watching the same shows on on Netflix we're all, we're all doing basically the same stuff now that we're in this pandemic uh, situation, we're we're all here in Zoom, and uh, you know, th this idea of we all around the world repeating the same activities and talking about the same things, this is kind of a really new situation for all of us. And um, I really think that this novel is about how that contemporary experience is lived in a in a third world country you know in a in a third world city i would say which is um which is also at the same time you know again the contrast between a very modern context but at the same time sort of an archaic antique or old-fashioned place you know so all these mm, times clashing uh with each other and um i don't know i really i really I would really prefer um, 
a different uh, approach to my to my to my novel, which which <laughs> have been a lot. I, I, there's been a lot of uh, of those approaches. You know, I, I really like um, you know uh, the people who wrote the blurbs. They were all amazing. I think they were just really really precise, really accurate. Um, so I guess what do you, what do you have to say about that? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Lizzie, do you want a guiding question or do you want to pipe in? <laughs> oh, you go ahead. Oh, I, I, another review on the topic of um, universality and of sort of this late capitalism, we're all watching the same shows, right? We all get Netflix, um, right? Uh, there is in the, the novel is not, as I remember, it's not set in Colombia explicitly or in a named city. Am I right about that? Um, but then You're it also, right. it does, right. it does, um, have these very, you know, allusions, especially in the, the stream of consciousness uh, chapters um, where number four is sort of tripping on this drug and, and giving these really interesting poetic um, stream of consciousness yeah. sections. Um, there are these allusions. Yeah. <laughs> Gremlins, there we go, thank you. Um, is she does, there are these allusions, like it is clear that there that this book came from Colombia. There are allusions to Spain's conquest of Latin America. Um, and so Lizzie, I'm wondering in your translation, um, one, one review wrote, Davis has skillfully captured the spare and economical prose, navigated masterfully the shifts in stylistic registers and made creative word choices without, without letting the reader forget for a moment that the book's nightmare is Colombian and universal at the same time. So in terms of this universality that Juan was just talking about being such an important part of the book at its core, but also this talk about how colonialism has everything to do with late capitalism is also a big part of it. And that's very applicable to the book's origins. How did you handle that? How did you navigate that as a translator? Jerry really comes up with the best questions, doesn't he, Juan? <laughs> He's killing us. I know. He's killing us. No, I think yeah. <laughs> said, um, just in his response to your last question about the idea that these um, events are feel very present. They feel like they're happening right now, but they also feel like they've been happening for a very, very, very long time. There's a timelessness to these issues. Um, there's the, I, I, one of the reviews that we've talked about domestic, colonial, nationalist, and religious exploitation and how that exploitation is happening now, but it's been happening, the reverberations of it, you, you know, you can sense that all the way back. So I think in translating Ornamental, um, I felt like it took place in, an, in a place outside of time, if that makes sense. I mean, I've talked about this a little bit, but there, you know, there are spider monkeys acting as security guards, but they're also henchmen at the same time. So there are all of these, kind of um, competing markers of where you are in time, which I think serves to dislocate the reader and put you in a, in a kind of universal space because these elements are at play in every space. <laughs> you can't, you can't um, really isolate them. But I do think there were some really specific words that I chose to keep in Spanish. Um, guacherna was one of them. Um, things that do <laughs> locate you in Colombia, there's a scene with a cab driver where he talks about Colombian women specifically. So I think there are things that locate you in Colombia, but at the same time, there's a universality that's um, unavoidable when you're talking about these concepts. I don't know if that necessarily answers your question, Jerry, but I did my best. <laughs> no, that's awesome. <laughs> um, um, uh, we have a question, and also if anybody has questions, please put them in the chat. Um, we have a question about if you could compare and contrast the use of repetition in the narrative structure of Ornamental and the 2018 song Ella ya me olvido by the revered Colombian bar band Los Nuevos Románticos. Um, I'm not familiar with this band or this song. Does anybody want to? Is this a trick? Who made that question? This is a, is deep this a trick. Well, who the hell made that Did question? Did I fall into a trap? What happened? You, you definitely have we been zoom bombed? Okay. Um, yes. Yes. Okay. We have. All right. We have, but but you know, it, you you guys are putting me in a very hard position in here. You know, I don't know who this person is. 
I have a lot of suspects, but, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> well, if for those of you, but, who you know, know uh, Juan is also a musician, so this is a kind of a deep cut of a question. Uh, we don't have to answer it if we don't want to. <laughs> um, okay, another question uh, is from a trans uh, from a, a commentator asking about. Um, with the improvements in Google Translate, they found that in the past it used to produce really comical results, and that recently, with improvements to the to the algorithms, it's become a lot better. And their implied question is, what is um, Google Translate's place in translation these days? Lizzie, do you want to take that one? Um, or if one, like we're all translators, so really. Yeah, that's true. We are. Well, I, I just just can can I can I just tell you Please. something very very quick, guys. Um, <laughs> I I <laughs> I'm a teacher as you as you said before, and uh, I have this uh, peculiar exercise with my friend with with my 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 students, <laughs> and um, th they I just give them a lot of poems by Cesar Vallejo, which you know are very cryptic and very hard to read. You know, from Trilce, which is his famous revered, uh, uh, incredible book. And um, I just, this there there's this first exercise where I just, what's this guy saying? Just tell me what's this guy saying? And no one can say exactly what this guy's saying. So we make this exercise where we put a lot of poems from Trilce Vallejo. We put him through, a, you know, to, through a, ser a series of, 10 different translations in Google Translate. You know, we, we just put the poem and then we just put it in, uh, I don't know, in Farsi or then just, uh, you know, any language, 10 languages, and then we put it back into Spanish and see what happens. And after we do that, the poem is really, uh, I mean, it's distorted. And, and, and I, tr and I try, you know, I, I, I just ask them to try to interpret the poem, uh, you know, putting the, the original one and then the, 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 the final one in, in, in dialogue. And um, it always come, they always come with a different uh, idea. They always come with a, with a different, um, um, I don't know, interpretation of what the poem is saying. So I would say th this, this, this is a wonderful tool for for distorting things. Yeah, I think that's no? I, think that's so I love it. I just love it. I think um, thinking of it as almost its own generative creative tool is really helpful. I remember in the first translation workshop that I ever took, um, we listened to recordings of poems from languages we had never understood, never, never learned, and then tried to write um, <laughs> translations of them just based off our own the way that they struck us sonically and if we could find any homophones and um i think that google translate can be kind of a generative creative tool tool in that same way where you're getting something that's so distorted that it becomes something else and you can use that in a creative practice i know a lot of translators maybe not a lot i've heard talk of translators who use electronic translation as kind of creating a scaffolding for their translations, um, but I have never attempted that myself, so I don't know, and I don't know what it would, what will happen in the future. I fear a future where robots can translate Juan's books better than I can. But <laughs> I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about that. <laughs> Uh, I don't I know, know. maybe I for commercial it. translation, I think for commercial translation, maybe using an automated translation um, software to create some kind of first draft is more common, but not that I know of in literary translation. I think um, speaking as I, I work as both, I translate literature and I do commercial translation of like birth certificates, uh, you know, museum texts, contracts, whatever people will hire me for. Um, and I will say like there is, I think it's much more of a, a perceived threat or evolution in the world of commercial translation where you have these non-creative texts um, that are, can essentially be, um, you know, they're very repetitive, they're very formulaic and there is no creative spirit um, as versus something like a novel or a poem, which I don't think a computer will be able to 
translate that until the computer can write that. Well, come on, um, gotta be some creative spirit in a birth certificate. <laughs> Oh yeah, they don't, they don't like, it. sometimes I'm like to my clients, I'm like, I inserted something like a little bit like a literary flair. Like Juan Cardenas said that you're supposed to betray the text in your translation. Um, okay. Um, okay, also on the topic of the art and betrayal, um, the, the book uh, Ornamental, Ornamento talks about um, a meaning as surplus or at least a character, the, the doctor's wife in the book talks about meaning as surplus and as an accident. And I wonder, um, Juan, um, actually for both of you, Juan as a writer and Lizzie as the translator, um, how as someone who creates an artistic work, which presumably is, you know, at least typically supposed to have some meaning, um, how, do you, how do you feel about that as a creator? Um, Juan as somebody writing it, and then Lizzie as a translator who is presumably, you know, uncoding meaning and then reconveying it. How do you um, interpret that? Um, and if anyone has any questions, put them in the chat and we can ask them. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> That's a um, I try to ask really specific questions. No, I, think, yeah. I, mean, I think the question of how meaning is made is kind of at the core of the book, at least for me, Juan. I mean, the, the way that you use language to create meaning through the mouth of the doctor and also through the mouth of number four. They're very different approaches to meaning. And one of them, I mean, they're governed by completely different rules, but they both create meaning, right? Because there isn't just one route to meaning. And I think that's part of what attracts me to this book most. So I think you can jump in at any point. <laughs> um, I, I, I told no, I totally, I totally agree because uh, that's that's exactly what I was thinking when when Jerry was asking us his his, his great question, uh, which is a uh, um, uh, well, um, I like to think about meaning as a slippery surface. You know, I like the idea of meaning making as an inevitably slippery activity. You know, um, and this, this, this sort of um, accidental uh, movement of meaning is not something I despise. Uh, on the contrary, I think uh, literature is about looking for that slippery surface. I mean, um, and you know, the whole novel is a reflection about that. The whole novel is a, re just Lizzie just said it perfectly. It's, um, it's a reflection on, on how do we how do we confront this um, this task of of being in a world we cannot express in a meaningful way, not anymore. I mean, this is a this is a whole puzzle that it's it's it's, a, it's just a mystery we, we don't know we, we 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 really don't understand the world we're living in nobody nobody does um but you know we have to be brave enough to to know that and to explore that uh mis that mystery you know mm. well that's about it that's something i really loved in the novel was this like really profound feeling of um like decadentia right this feeling of decline um, and of like meaning not lo no longer being something you can grasp. Um, which again, seems very, I don't know if I'm just projecting this because I know you translate Faulkner, um, <laughs> but it does seem very Faulknerian. That can't be a word. Um, <laughs> um, a question from the audience, um, a question for Lizzie. I'm curious what your process at arriving of the translation of the title. I love ornamental. It's so much better than the flat ornament, which is perhaps closer to ornamento. Do, do you consider other options as well? Yes, yes. Who is this person? I like this to... is Jennifer S. Hello, Jennifer. I'd like to know who I'm speaking to. I'm sorry. <laughs> the title was definitely something we discussed a lot. Sorry, can I just interrupt? I'm now totally traumatized that all of these questions are traps. That <laughs> like some, <laughs> some enemy of Juan or you is in there just screwing with us. OK, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, no, we talked a lot about, well, initially, of course, I thought, oh, ornament, you know, ornamento, it's a, the, the noun form, so it would make sense to translate that literally, but I brought it to 
coffee house where I also work, which is quite a fortunate arrangement and got to talk to the marketing and publicity staff there. And they said, oh, ornament, that sounds like something you would hang on a Christmas tree. We can't possibly separate that from this notion of ornaments as something that you, you know, bring out in December every year. And then was it you, Juan, who came up with the brilliant, who had the brilliant idea to to use ornamental? I think it was. I remember. I think I think it was me. I think it was me. You came back with your perfect solution <laughs> because I think it really amplifies the possible readings of the title. You know, to have it in this form as ornamental. So, how did you arrive at that? Probably because you're a genius. But I, I think that was the only the only thing I just changed in the whole uh, manuscript uh, in Liz's translation. I mean, I read Liz's translation. I didn't touch a single comma, literally, literally. I didn't touch anything. But once we started discussing about the, the title, I just realized how weird it sounded in, in English. Yeah. And it, it really, it really does. It, 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 because in, in, it, in Italy, it was translated ornamento, just the same word. Mm -hmm. And it has exactly the same implications and, you know, um, it's kind of a, the same feel, sort of, uh, but in English it definitely sounded weird. So um, I just came up with this, this idea the, of using the, the adjective, you know. Yeah, and, and I think that was, you know, yeah. A major contribution for sure. And it makes me think too of like ornamental um, shrubs, you know, like clipping mm. plants into ornamental forms. It expands the body from the human body to, you know, the body of shrubs. <laughs> the social body. So there's a lot of, a lot being um, ornamentized. We'll just go with that. <laughs> Um, did you, um, and then in the, in the, there's the two epigraphs or the two opening quotes at the beginning of the book, um, the Adolf Luce, do you know what language was that quote originally written in? Uh, Every age had its style, is our age al alone to be refused a style? And then it goes on from there. It's in German, it's in German. Um, he was, he was from, he was from, from Austria, I think, um, Adolf Luce. Um, but I, 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 just didn't get the the original quote i just put it in spanish so i was like yeah <laughs> so lizzie did you for your translate in the translated english version did you find is there an established translation of that or how did you That's go about getting a really that? good question yeah i found um the established translation of that but for the following um epigraph the ballad of the mad owls there wasn't something that i could find so that was mm. translated from spanish but yeah, I, pref I prefer to use the original source if there is one uh, for mm. something like that, for a quotation like that. Um, and I wanted to familiarize myself with the, the ornament in crime that the quotation is drawn from. So I had to find it anyway. <laughs> yeah, well, I love that quote, especially with the title ornamental. And then you get in there and he talks about ornament, ornament, ornament. I was wondering if there was some creative process involved in, in how you chose those. Um, and I did not realize that you translated the second quote. This is really lovely, lovely done. Oh, thank you. Really I, delightfully executed would be a normal way of saying that. that I, <laughs> there was something that I couldn't completely capture. I can't remember what because I don't have the Spanish in front of me, mm. but I just have the English. I'm glad to hear it worked for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think we're just about out of it time. It works, it works. <laughs> <laughs> um. Are there any other questions from the audience at all? I can't see them. Only Jerry can see them. No, that's. I think that's. Um, once you sort out all of the trolls, that's all that we have left. Um, uh, so thank you guys for joining us. Um, the book is ornamental, and Southwest Review has um, the short story "The Bird" by Juan Cardenas, translated by Lizzie Davis. Um, yeah, yeah, this has been really fun, guys. Dallas Thank Literary you, Festival, Greg, Bobby, um, and Lori, you're also wonderful. Thank you for supporting our work. And thank you to all of the attendees for being here. 
with us. Yes. Thank you so much. This was a, a delightful panel and we really enjoyed it. Thank you to all our guests uh, through our, our little um, technical difficulties too. <laughs> and we hope you attend um, our last uh, panel sessions that are coming up. <laughs>